No problem, eh? Huh? I'll send a copy to you. I was born in number six, Brayson Street, in 1966. In 1970, when I was four year old, we were forced out of our house. And where it stood is now the start of the Brayson Street Peace Line. When I was younger, I used to think about what, what life would have been like living there on Brayson Street in a nice big house with a big family. And what a beautiful sight. You walk out your front door and there's a beautiful church grounds and a beautiful 19th century church. And then what would have been like living in a normal, sort of normal society, as opposed to what I ended up growing up in. It's very easy to put up a wall, especially when you have a team of architects and limitless budgets, you can put up a wall anywhere at any time. But the hard part's taking it down. That's what we have to address. There are physical structures, sort of manifestations of long-held psychological boundaries, I feel like. Especially along here, along the Falls Road, Shankill Road, where people were living together uneasily since partition. After the pogroms of the 1920s, things sort of settled down until the political situation here exploded in 1969. The resultant sectarian violence gave way to numerous barricades along all, all the interfaces in Belfast. The British Army came along in 1969 and sort of that was the start of physical structures coming into place. When peace walls were first erected, these modern day peace walls in 71-72, there was a meeting uh, of the then Northern Ireland executive and they decided to put the peace walls up because they thought it was better that communities at that time would fight with the army or be kept apart and they thought that was better in the short term and it was supposed to be a temporary thing. There was a minority report from a, an English advisor who couldn't be at the meeting and that minority report said, be careful about putting these peace walls up because they won't come down for 100 years. Short term decision making, which has had hugely impactful long term consequences for Belfast and for those communities. My decision to start documenting the walls was to satisfy my, my own questions around what the peace lanes were, what they meant, what they were about, how they came about, and what effect it was having on, on people who lived, lived alongside them. There's definitely a lot more optimism around in 94 when I started. The first series of pictures were published in a, an exhibition catalogue by Belfast Exposed. The date was the 1st of September 1994 when the book was launched and that was the day that the IRA called the first ceasefire. You know, maybe things could change here. Maybe we could see these walls coming down. 
But of course, things changed, but painfully slow, really, really uh, agonizingly slow. And here I am, 2019, 25 years later, coinciding with the 50th anniversary of the first wall going up in 69. Your smell. <laughs> the sack full of film and I intend to use it. <laughs> it's always been a, it's a very typical British thing, it's the, the divide, the conquer. People on the either side of the peace lines wouldn't normally get to see what's on the other side. But I suppose uh, in one way I, I'm filling that gap. That I'm, Letting people you know, see what's see what's like on the other side. They'll find it very similar. The short strand, it's a small Catholic enclave in a uh, predominantly Protestant East Belfast. Gilles Perez, the magnet photographer, he described it in a, a piece he wrote for my photographs way back uh, in 1997, where he says that the short strand is like a, it's like an island or a prison, depending on the mood you're in. It's completely surrounded and it's hemmed in. It's exacerbated by these walls that are 30 foot high and extend around most of the back part of the short strand. It's not a nice thing, but you seem to be like uh, unwanted by you know the rest of East Belfast. And you're just isolated, as I say. You know, you can see yourself how peaceful it is and the children just play about. You know, it's a different world entirely from leaving the short strong. I just can't wait to get down. And I think everybody's the same down here, that to get down to a bit of normality, especially over the 12th, like, you know, it's, it's not a nice place to be. Frankie at school, he was in the biology to be a vet. And then um, one of the teachers had a friend and he had a wee stroke, Basil, and he needed a big fella to carry his tripod with him. So Frankie started to do that and he got into photography. And that was, I don't know where the biology went to after that. Yeah, from my 16th birthday, my dad, my dad bought me a camera. I got into a bit of trouble the year before that there with the police and stuff like that. 1981 during the hunger strike. I started photographing the people there and then I just mushroomed into this whole thing. I just captured the, the essence of the area, basically the, the life of it. He has one of me washing Christine's sink. <laughs> Her right there. You know, bath him in the short strong. <laughs> you always needed encouragement, especially in the early days when you didn't know what they were doing. You know, didn't know why, why am I doing this? Why, what the f I should be like, in a proper job earning fucking money. But the other desire to overcame that. <laughs> he has no enemies on both sides. His work takes him wherever it goes, it doesn't matter. Even now my Frankie's 50 odd years of age, I still worry about him. You know, it doesn't matter because you've got a camera that you're going to be safe, you'll not be. I just say, watch yourselves. Just be on your guard. The key of this is the experiential kind of aspect and people get a sense of what it is, mm -hmm. you know, 
And the very words that you said in your um, CV or cover mm. statement was, it is claustrophobic, you know. Well, the context behind it is that I live in a short strand. Yeah. I still live there after 25 years. Mm. And it affects my life on a daily mm. basis. Actually. It does. So, yeah. and, and it's only when you, and I've seen that wall, I've seen mm. that wall from many different angles. But seeing as you're standing and you're mm. facing it and you're actually engaging with it at that level, can you only understand it? Mm -hmm. um, and photography is amazing because it has that accessibility and it mm -hmm. has that ability to tell that truth. I kind of like this, but without the blue side it's too. It's a bit of a mirror. I think that's quite cliche. There's, there's a reason behind it. There's no, it's not, the flowers aren't there for uh, cliche, it's the, they're there for because somebody was killed or something there, you know, in, in and the same that, way. And, is that not a cliche image that we pretend to see here in Northern Ireland? And it's not, that it's not a justifiable image in any capacity, but I just would question if it's right for this exhibition, okay. that's all I'm saying. Anything controversial, it's always good business to stay away from anything, but you can have people protesting or anything like that. I'm sure you know. have to be controversial for not mm -hmm. controversial, mm -hmm. but you know, no, not so tackle the issue um, or, or confront it, or, or, or I mean, the reason why the, the peace things were put up in the first place was because of sectarian violence. Mm -hmm. People getting killed. That's that's but fact. I don't want to bring negativity to my doorstep mm -hmm. either, but I just think this is this is such a fantastic opportunity for us to really engage within the, the that peace process in a real meaningful way, but we do have to handle it appropriately. I'll be down, I don't think I'll be here in a hundred years, the walls, you know, thankful. Of, I think in a hundred years we'll have waved up enough. You know, and uh, and see the and seeing the walls for what they are, and 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 what they are is um, they're not helpful for community relations for a start. They don't help. They don't work. And the world seems to be fencing itself off most notably because of being there to photograph it uh, a few times, the separation wall in Palestine, which is basically um, the annexation of the West Bank. And that's not going to solve any problems within Palestine. That's going to exacerbate. Yeah. Daddy birds have their pig. Nick. What Trump's trying to do across Mexico is not going to solve any problems there. You should look at these walls in the, as an example of the idea of keeping people out and separating people not working. See, people have to interact or be able to, to see each other, to get to know each other, and become, you know, I wouldn't say not, not, not friends, but not you know, kill each other. People will hopefully see that, you know, there's not that much difference between us. Take, strip away the politics and the religion and then we're all working class people. And hopefully people will get to see that, you know, that we're... we're it's worth a fuck. Where are you from? Italy. Ah, I thought that, yeah. Yeah. And the, the small parades, yeah. I, I like them. It's different for us living in there, you know. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, a, yeah, no, I know. It's a, it's a noise we don't like. We, we don't... Uh, no. Well, for what it represents, it's a way of basically showing who's boss here, if you know. Ah, okay. It's, yeah. it's triumphalism. It's some of the songs, anti-Catholic tunes. Well, that's why we don't like them. Oh, okay. They're aimed at us. 
I mean, I could easily stay with any Spellfest and not come anywhere near the short film, but what's the point of parading if you can't antagonize anyone? I mean, why do you have to close the street if it's a parade? Well, historically, there's been trouble. Yeah, I know, I know. You know? So it's just a way of controlling the area. And I remember as a child standing at the barriers and watching the parades go back. And sometimes it got uh, out of hand, you know, there was serious trouble. And, oh, yeah, yeah. That's all stopped, really, you know, it's, uh, it's not the same. I'm glad to say. What have you got to do with it? Okay, what's he? Here, what's he got to do with it? What's he got to do with it? What's he got to do with it? What's he fucking doing filming people? What the fuck's your problem? There's hundreds of people filming. Go away the fuck, all right? He's interrupting the parade. Nobody was interrupting. He's interrupting the fucking parade. All right, well, no problem. Hey Tom, let's get out. I think most of the images that we see around on the walls here, off the walls, we would see if we took photographs of any working class community anywhere on these islands. They're the communities that suffered most during the conflict. And if we're going to address the issue of bringing peace walls down, we have to address the social and economic issues underlying many of the attitudes and many of the problems in those communities. 20 years on from the agreement, 93% uh, of social housing in Belfast is still segregated exactly the way it was 20 years ago. The amount of segregation in education is exactly the same as it was 20 years ago. We really need to take those high-level policy decisions to start to tackle these issues and these problems, and we haven't done it yet. Otherwise, we won't conclude this peace process. What I'm trying to do is to get it into people's minds that they do exist and that unless we talk about it and, and ask ourselves questions and especially the young ones now, you know, you know, they should be asked, do you want to live in a, in a divided society like this? And they're the ones that's going to have to come up with the answers. Not now, like more than someone commenting, making a nice comment about your photographs, or it touched them in a way. If it touches them, then you've, you've done it. But it's a lovely feeling, it's a nice feeling. It keeps you going, it keeps you. That's why you do it, isn't it? You've made the connection. Well, I just keep recording the walls until they go or I do. <laughs>